Well, first of all, why is this question important? After all, it's 75 years since Pakistan came into existence as an independent state. It is uh, something that rightly belongs to the past. And why do we need to think about the two-nation theory? The answer is very simple, that it is the official raison d'etre for Pakistan's existence, the reason why Pakistan exists. So in spite of all the political turmoil that you hear about Pakistan, there is no one that is currently even asking this question for a very good reason that the two-nation theory is what is called the ideology of Pakistan. It was called that after Jinnah died in 1948. And under Section 123A of the Pakistan Penal Code, contesting the ideology of Pakistan is punishable by up to 10 years of rigorous imprisonment. Now, having said that, there is no official document that tells you what the ideology of Pakistan is, but there is a street version. Pakistan ka matlab kya la ilaha illallah. Grammatically, as far as Urdu goes, it's, it's wrong. I mean, you can't say the meaning of Pakistan is that there is no God except Allah. But anyway, that, that's what it is. So I think it's particularly important to look at this question academically. What and when and how did the ideology of Pakistan come about? In particular, how did the two-nation theory emerge, evolve? So to get a proper perspective, you must go back a thousand years, maybe more, to know that uh, India was never a unified whole, that it was fragmented. There was no readily identified Hindu identity, and this according to uh, very reputable Indian historians like Romila Thapar, uh, many others too, like Jha. It was different in different places, shifting over time, and there was um, um, no monolithic, there is no monolithic founder, there's no monolithic set of beliefs, there's no founder of, uh, of uh, Hinduism. And in fact, the very term Hindu comes from the river, the Sindh, the, the, the river Darya Sindhu. And Al-Hind is really, as uh, uh, Romila Thapar points out, an Arabic term which is used as, uh, you, which was used in a geographical context, not in a religious context. Equally, there was no sense of Muslimness amongst those who, amongst those Muslims who lived on the Indian subcontinent. Now, the Arabs had been coming to India even before Islam, and they had settled on the western coast of India. Uh, you had then the invasion by Muslims in 712 of Muhammad bin Qasim, who came to Sindh, and, uh, well, about, we, we, did, we don't uh, have very good records, but Chachnama is, is one record, but the best records that we have are those from the Arabic traveler Al-Biruni, who came about 200 years after Muhammad bin Qasim. And uh, uh, Al-Biruni actually was a scholar, a real scholar, who spent something like 13 years learning Sanskrit. And uh, he went from place to place, understanding customs, understanding even Hindu mathematics. And it is probably through him that uh, the zero reached Arabic civilization. Now, what's very interesting is that uh, if you look at 
the the writings of al biruni and by the way they are available on the inter- uh, on the internet and they're fascinating he's for him the real muslims were the arabs turks and uh, the persians those muslims who lived in india he referred to them as hindu now isn't that amazing that he would be calling the local converts as hindu because this was just a geographical term it is those people who lived in al hind and uh, he noted that there is no cohesive identity either among the muslims over there or the hindus and he also noted that when muhammad bin qasim came and he defeated raja dahir well the other hindu rajas did not come to the defense of raja dahir well let's move on even in moral times and that's about 350 years or so identities were very amorphous so at the courts of the moral people were divided not into hindu and muslim factions but rather into turkish and persian ones and of course the turkish and the persian ones were way above the local muslims or the hindus so it it was a very mixed bag at that time you couldn't say that there was a hindu identity or a muslim identity in in india even in mughal times plus there was syncretism of 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 religion and in fact this was developed further by akbar in his deen e ilahi um, akbar and and of course every the all peoples over there at that time were of mixed origin so akbar who was by the way a, a sunni and a hanaf and one who belonged to the hanafi stream he was half persian and uh, half uh, um, a local jahangir was half rajput and quarter persian and shah jahan he was uh, three quarters rajput well that syncretism that adoption of of uh, local customs of course inspired a counter reaction and we have even at the time of akbar uh the purifiers of islam emerging who said that we must get rid of all these things which uh, uh are really not part of islam and uh, the first amongst them was sheikh uh, sheikh ahmed sir hindi he was followed by shah waliullah and then of course his son shah abdul aziz who led the insurgency against the british was another one now uh waliullah was very adamant he said that we muslims are arabs and we are in exile in in india and we must purge all these accretions that are being made into our religion into our culture and um he was um, so this is just at the time of aurangzeb so that uh, he writes to ahmed shah abdali he says come and so ahmed shah abdali who was afghan he calls upon him to come and invade delhi and uh, ahmed shah abdali comes he uh, urges delhi but not of hindus of shias so it was enormous bloodletting well you could say that the purifiers of islam did have an effect but that effect in separating the hindu and muslims into two camps was minuscule it was minuscule because there were far too many different brands of local islams all around india and so the diversity defeated the efforts of people like shah waliullah and shah abdul aziz and so forth it's colonialism which was the game changer 
if we insist on giving the two nation theory or rather the emergence of two nations a date i'm not saying it's easy to give a date but if one has to i think it is 1857 the war of independence or the great mutiny as it's called thereafter the british reinvented india they had to reinvent india because they wanted to rule over it for a very long time and this involved a uh, restructuring india into administrative units and for having to do that you needed to know scientifically what would be the proper procedure and what's the scientific method of doing that you carry out a census so that census was carried out in 1872 i think or 1871 and this is the time that you had to declare yourself either as hindu buddhist or muslim and now because jobs in the civil service were all also done on a quota basis well it uh, it really became the basis of uh of giving people's definite identities now in this race of getting jobs the muslims lost out very very badly and so um there's there's a lot of documentation on this particularly by this englishman by the name of uh, william hunter and uh, hunter actually spends a lot of time he's from the civil service and he spends a lot of time in bengal and he says that uh, earlier on you could never conceive of a muslim as being poor and now the only muslims that you see are poor so this was um, um It, it, the muslims were losing out in in everything in um, uh, around the time of the census it was found that uh, in bengal if if i remember right that something like uh, out of 500 gazetted officers who were locals there were just uh, 12 or 13 of them who were muslims uh, in terms of um, those who graduated from calcutta university i think calcutta university was established in 1857 and 20 years after that the first muslim graduated and he was the first muslim in india to have graduated uh, uh, if i remember right that is 1870 or so in that same year and in the years before there were there were Uh, every year a hundred or more hindus who were graduating with uh, bachelors uh, probably masters but i think it was bas at that time now this is really the issue that then started bothering the muslims of north india that uh, they were losing out very badly now earlier they uh, had a lot of lands they were uh, uh, the, since persian was the language of the courts they had jobs in the court but uh, now because the british changed uh, from persian to english they were lost over there so why did the muslims lose out and what is it that caused the split between muslims and hindus to grow i think there were definite economic reasons for that the muslims were not equipped for modernity by because of their essentially their attitudes the attitude was that we are a superior people we have been given the last word by god in the form of the quran which is the literal word of god we have been the rulers of hindustan 
And it is just bad luck that is visiting us. And so the way ahead is to fight, fight the British, fight the Hindus and regain. But after 1857, it became pretty clear that you cannot do that. Now, earlier on, the British had had uh, wanted to replace local education with uh, with colonial with with modern education. Colonial education was modern education in those days, and to this, Hindus had responded positively. So 1835 is when the Macaulay reforms take place. And according to that, the British East India Company will no longer fund either madrasas or pachalas or any other traditional um, uh, uh, traditional institutions of learning. They will only support those schools which teach the English language, science, and modern subjects. Now, because of the Brahmo Samaj and people like Raja uh, Ram Mohan Roy, the Hindus were, were tuned to that way of thinking. There was less resistance. I won't say there was no resistance. Um, Hindu reformers had to go through a tough time, but Muslim reformers, and in fact, there's only one prominent Muslim reformer, Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan, who tried to do this, and he wasn't, well, I guess he had some measure of success. He did succeed in creating the um, uh, the Aligarh University eventually, uh, and his insistence was that Muslims who are in such a bad shape owe this to their neglect of modern subjects, in particular English and science. And so this was his great jihad uh, for the Muslims that you have to now move with the times. Of course, he's a complicated character. After all, he uh, aided the British uh, at every possible moment of their uh, history of of their being in um, in india he was um, he was unwilling to criticize even some of their very draconian measures but he justified all this in saying that it's the muslims who have to break with their traditions and unless they do that they're going to get lost and in this i think he was remarkably far-sighted because this is what uh, what widened the rift between hindus and muslims now why was there a difference in the first place it's because during the mughal era much of the intellectual work was done by Hindus and very little by Muslims. The Muslims were concentrating on looking after their jagirs. They were uh, more interested in hunting, sports, fine poetry, so some very good music uh, and, and art, miniature art came off in those days. But there was very little curi curiosity about the natural world. and. Okay, now, now I really must tell you that uh, this is not intrinsic to Islam, perhaps, but it was intrinsic to, to Indian Islam. So if one looks back at the 9th through the 13th centuries in, in uh, places like Baghdad, in Arabia, essentially, you do, you do see... Uh, a great spurt in intellectual development. Of course, that started with the influx of, that started with the translation of Greek works into Arabic, and then it led to some spectacular results, like uh, the theory of light by Ibn al-Hashim, the creation of the, very, the creation of the concept of algorithm by Al-Khwarizmi, etc. Lots of things like that. But 
that never reached the Indian subcontinent. And one sees that at the time that the British East India Company was expanding and it was seeking to uh, bring the, inter the interesting new ideas developed during the scientific revolution, the Mughals showed very little interest in that. So um, the interest then was confined to a very different direction. Then comes imperialism, colonialism in a big way, and um, the Muslims eventually lose out. That was when, to my mind, the, the differences started to grow. Now, they did not necessarily have to grow further, but they did. They did because the British certainly had a role over there to play in divide and rule. The more the natives fought amongst themselves, the easier it would be to contain them. And uh, what we see is that parties like the uh, Hindu Mahasabha, this at a later stage, emerged. We see that Muslims get more and more communalized, that they are aided on by rulers and by leaders. And we see that um, over time, it is Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan who was initially not a communalist. He develops elements of communalism in him. And then uh, this gets passed on. Now, I'm not saying which community is more at fault, but these rifts grow and then comes along Muhammad Ali Jinnah and with his two nation theory which he articulates in 1940 in Lahore he says that Hindus and Muslims are two separate peoples they cannot ever live in peace because they have different heroes they eat differently they don't intermarry etc he ignores all those centuries of peaceful coexistence. And yes, there was peaceful ex coexistence, even though there was also competition and conflict between them. Let's remember that even at the time of Mughal rule in India, which was, which was basically Muslim rule, yet there, was, uh, there were intermarriages. And even at the time of Aurangzeb, we see that some of his generals are Rajputs who want to de defeat Shivaji. So it was much more complicated that, than what Jinnah had set out to be. In the end, I want to say, on the end on this point, that to my mind, it was these material circumstances which led to the widening of the gap and held, hence ultimately to two distinctive identities emerging. Well, I won't say distinctive, but two uh, identifiable camps. This two-nation theory gave birth to Pakistan in 1947. It's like an umbilical cord. Without stressing the difference between Hindus and Muslims, Jinnah could not have achieved Pakistan. However, once Pakistan was achieved, then he realized that it was now going to be a disaster to play on this anymore. And so his famous speech of 11th of August 1947 comes along in which he says, you are free to go to your mosque, you are free to go to your temples. It is not a matter of the state. You can do whatever you like, etc. And he doesn't at all mention the two-nation theory. Well, Jinnah didn't uh, persevere on that. And you could argue that he was... Uh, 
old and he was uh, sick and so uh, that's why he didn't do it. But surely now it is time to junk it. I say this at the risk of uh, running afoul of um, the penalties, but now it is redundant. Let's get rid of the two-nation theory. However, I do realize that uh, people in Pakistan as yet cannot say that openly. So now let me come to my second question. It's also a question which, um, well, is speculative, but uh, I think it has a more definite answer than the one that I gave for my earlier question. The question is, why is Pakistan a Praetorian state, but India is not? Praetorian is a difficult word, but uh, what it means if you open up the dictionary, it's uh, a state which is dominated by the military, not because the military wants to win wars, but because it wants to have an inordinate amount of influence on the state. And that is a good, um, I'd say, way of summarizing the Pakistani political system. It is Praetorian in the sense that the military essentially makes all the big decisions that govern the economy, that govern foreign relations, and in the present age, nuclear weapons, and even in such things as making roads or dams, and of course, disaster relief. So what is it that makes Pakistan a Praetorian state? And here we must go back to the very beginnings. When Jinnah started the movement for Pakistan, he uh, <clears throat> had to gather around him people who were influential in the, mil in, the, in the Muslim community at the time. And the powerful people were the big landlords. There were a few capitalists, but mostly these were people with large land holdings. Yeah, some of them may have gone to uh, get degrees in England, but uh, that didn't change their feudal mindset. So the Muslim League was basically a bunch of feudals, feudal landlords, who were who were convinced that they were the ones who really mattered and they had great contempt for those below them. And I should say that uh, Jinnah is to be included in that. Jinnah was extremely anti-socialist uh, and extremely anti-communist. And uh, he had actually thought of uh, while he was in England, he had thought of running for the Tory party. But uh, it turns out that they didn't want to give him a seat. So anyway, he made a lot of money as a lawyer and came back and became very influential in the community of Muslims in India. <clears throat> okay, so when... Pakistan came into being in 1947, the Muslim League was intellectually very weak. Jinnah was the only person who had ideas of where to go, what to do, and he was fully in control of things. He didn't trust anybody else in the Muslim League. That's why he appointed himself governor general. And he took all the, and being governor general meant that he had every single bit of authority in his own hands. 
He couldn't trust the feudals because he knew that they would be fighting for their own local interests for increasing their their land, um, uh, getting concessions from the government or whatever. And so um, there was really a vacuum. Now, in this vacuum, there was only one institution that was strong, and that was the Pakistan army. Let's remember that uh, this Pakistan army, like the Indian army, was trained in British institutions in places like uh, Sandhurst, for example, or in Dehradun, wherever, and that they, some of them had fought together in the Second World War as well. There was a sense of, there was a sense of being comrades, and there was this common military culture between the two armies. In fact, in the 1947 and in the 1965 wars where they fought each other, when one would lose to the other, they would be uh, they'd get together still in the uh, and and have a drink. Well, the difference, I suppose, is that not I suppose, but the difference between the Indian and the Pakistani armies was that they were faced with different qualities of civilian leadership. So on the Indian side, there was Jawaharlal Nehru, a man who had a vision of India, who even while he was in prison, put there by the British, wrote books and wanted India to be a modern state, one that would move along the direction that the industrialized economies of the world had moved. And so his was, his vision was to aim in a very classical way towards modernity. Now Jinnah too was a modern man. Let's not forget that. He too was a modern man, but Jinnah did not have a vision for Pakistan. Jinnah just wanted Pakistan. And here I must tell you that uh, people take it, Pakistanis take it very badly when uh, in discussions I say that Jinnah did not have a vision for Pakistan because everybody here says the reason Pakistan has gone wrong is that we have not been following Jinnah's vision. And I ask, where is that vision? He never wrote a book. He never wrote a concept paper. He, have, he had been in politics for 20 years or more, well, 30 years or more. And he never told us what Pakistan was to be. He never said that Pakistan was to be a secular state. Sometimes he would say that uh, Islam was the best way and that uh, Islam was the way that Pakistan should go in every field, in politics, in economics, in this, in that. But he never made anything explicit. He did not know the Quran. He never quoted from it. He had never known the fact that in history, there has never been such a thing as an Islamic state. So when people used to ask Jinnah before partition, Sir, what is Pakistan to be? Is it to be a secular state or a theocratic state? Is it to be a liberal democracy? Is it to be socialist or what? He would say, don't ask this question. Wait until we have territory and then everything will be solved. And so that was his way of postponing that. Why did he do it? Well, because if he had said Pakistan is going to be this or that, well, then he would have lost support from this quarter or that quarter. And so therefore he said, just shut up. Don't ask what Pakistan is to be about. And so 
my contention is that Pakistan was born in a state of confusion. This is the confusion that allowed the military to become stronger and stronger. And so by 1951, the Pakistan army was taking many major decisions, major initiatives of its own. So while Ayub Khan was the commander in chief, and this is uh, uh, 1951 to 1958, he was also the minister of defense and Ayub Khan could veto, this one man could veto anything that the parliament or the government had decided. Anything that he felt that was inimical to the interests of the armed forces. In contrast, I'd say that Jawaharlal Nehru held the Indian army on a very tight leash. The commander-in-chief was not to be given a house as big as that of the prime minister. The army was to be kept out of all major decisions that included uh, relations with uh, foreign countries. Weapon systems had to be approved by parliament. And so the Indian army was never called upon to uh, help in the construction of uh, dams or roads or create its own companies that would uh, th th that could be contracted with for constructing these civil works. I think the the reason is the reason that India was able to do so, but Pakistan was not was because India was able to uh, develop a thick layer of institutions. And these are leaders who could forge their identities and capacities in, in some struggle for democracy. And so they were able to maintain this the, the link between citizens and politicians. That didn't happen in Pakistan. And... Um, it, it was basically because the, the Muslim League had collapsed. By 1951, the Muslim League had essentially dissolved. So this is two years after, three years after Jinnah's death. It went, it just broke apart. And it was, and any attempt to revive it would result even in more factionalism. Because there was no thinking about what Pakistan had to be. Why Pakistan? Sure, there's the two-nation theory. Sure, the Hindus and Muslims can't live together. But how do we Muslims live together? There was no thinking on that. And to this day, Pakistan suffers. So even in the current political turmoil, you see this coming up again and again. What's it all about? Okay, so I think I have been able to attempt an explanation of why Pakistan has fallen under the military, under their boots. But now, in the at the very end, let me come to the question, a very speculative one, was partition preventable? And had it not happened, what might have been the consequences? Well, look, uh, I, I, I know there are a lot of what-if questions in history. What if this had not happened, or this had happened, or that had not happened, etc. I know there's not going to be any uh, definitive answer, but why don't we just speculate? So. Um, suppose the 1946 cabinet mission plan had been accepted instead of rejected, rejected not by the Muslim League, but by the Indian National Congress. Of course, we know, you and I know that Jinnah 
seized that opportunity. He called for direction, direct action day. And this was, uh, I think, the 16th of August, 1946, after which 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 people were dead on the streets. It was his way of saying that now Pakistan has to be made. The Congress has refused has has refused to uh, be flexible. Hindus want to dominate Muslims. We will not accept it. And so come what may, Pakistan is now to be reality. Well, uh, as many of you know, Maulana Abul Kalam Azad, in his autobiography, he had two sections of that. In the last section, he said that there is something that is not to be revealed until 30 years after I am dead. And when that was revealed, it showed his criticism of Nehru and of Gandhi. And remember that Azad was as close to the Congress and as close to these two people as could possibly be. And he was critical. He says, this was a terrible, terrible mistake to have made, to have rejected the cabinet mission plan, to have then brought Pakistan into existence. There could not have been something, anything worse. Actually, Nehru, uh, he gave an interview to the New York Times many, many years later, and he too said, yes, I have second thoughts about that rejection. Okay, but that Let's that, let that be as it may. What would have happened if the cabinet mission plan had been accepted? Well, uh, let's be pessimistic first. <laughs> so pe pessimism is always easier, isn't it? You could have had chaos that continued indefinitely. You could have had a dysfunctional government you could have had a coalition government of Muslims and Hindus in Delhi. But if you're pessimistic, you can always believe that it would have quickly fallen apart, that communal tensions would have flared up again, and this time it would have blazed on and on. After all, peoples who have lived together for a long time, uh, sometimes the tensions cross a limit where living together peacefully is no longer possible. And we see that you had this extreme hate-filled violence of the Serbs, the Croats, and the Bosnian Muslims. Certainly, Yugoslavia could not have remained together. Okay, so that's the that's a possibility. It's possible that... Uh, the uh, clone of uh, Narendra Modi would have emerged at that time rather than Nehru. Nehru gets displaced and uh, RSS comes up. All these are possibilities. Okay. And we can... Today, there are a lot of people in Pakistan who are saying that, look what's happened, what's happening in India is justification. It's proof that the two-nation theory was correct. It's proof that we needed partition. Okay, that's a point of view. But I think that one can also be optimistic. After all, Muslims and Hindus had lived together for a very long time and on very good terms. I can tell you that my father who was a Sindhi, had only Hindu friends, and he was devastated when Pakistan happened. We could have, therefore, hoped for a steady depoliticization of, of religion and far greater tolerance. Let's remember the fact, and this is very, very important, that in 1937, 
the muslim league had was 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 trounced it was trashed in punjab that very punjab which saw the greatest communal bloodletting ever probably in the history of the world in 1937 the muslim league was defeated by the unionist party which had within it muslim sikh and hindu landlords they were the powerful people of the time but the unionist party could defeat the the muslim league this is actually the time that jinnah said uh uh-uh, uh forget secular politics now we must go communal whole hog now we have to say that we are fighting for islam that islam is in danger etc so optimistically if if uh, those politicians hadn't been around muslims and hindus could have lived in in peace with each other the benefits of that as we see today would have been enormous there would have been no kashmir dispute there would have been a greater acceptance of modernity among muslims there would have been uh, good universities for muslims to have gone to the ones we have in pakistan are trash i've taught there for now for 47 years as subhash told you and there's not one university which is worth going to so optimistically that could have happened after all such transformations have occurred elsewhere maybe this conflict between hindus and muslims and maulana azad used to say that is that just this is just a transient phase in the life of india that we can all learn to live together well we don't have a definite answer but uh, it's quite likely it could have happened in a parallel universe this is certainly one of the possibilities okay i finished thanks very much